Welcome to episode 191 of Angela Watson's Truth for Teachers. I'm your host, Angela Watson, and I'm here to speak life, encouragement, and truth into the minds and hearts of educators and get you energized for the week ahead. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Robin Jackson about how to break motivation barriers for disengaged students. Visit truthforteachers.com to get the transcript or find our new Truth For Teachers podcast community on Facebook. Would you like community support and training to help you enhance your own and your students' well-being? Breathe for Change offers the world's only 200-hour wellness, SEL, and yoga teacher training specifically for educators. And they partner with schools, districts, and organizations to enhance community-wide well-being. You've heard me interview their founder on episode 173 of the podcast, so you know what a life-changing program this is. The Breathe for Change training is held across um, the country nationwide, and applications for 2020 are now open. The training will empower you to integrate mindfulness and socio-emotional learning into your classroom and community. Not only can you earn a 200-hour yoga teacher certification, you can also get grad credits and CEUs. If you are committed to using wellness as a vehicle for social change, and you want to join an incredible community of thousands of like-minded leaders, then join the Breathe for Change movement and check out the trainings near you at breatheforchange.com forward slash truth. So you might remember that Dr. Robin Jackson was my guest back on season five, episode 14 of the podcast. It was an episode that I titled how to respond to rude, disrespectful student attitudes. It was one of the most downloaded episodes of the podcast ever, not only because of the topic, but because of Robin's wonderful way of addressing the root problems of things in a really realistic and practical way. If you're not familiar with her work, Robin is the founder of Mind Steps, Inc., and she's the author of 10 best-selling books, along with being the foremost expert in helping school administrators build a bigger vision, develop a better process, and achieve a brighter future for their schools. Since the last time she was on the show, Robin has also started her own podcast called School Leadership Reimagined. It is a fantastic resource if you want to hear more from Robin on how to use feedback, support, accountability, and culture to build a better school using the resources that your school already has. Now, Robin's back on the show today to discuss disengaged learners. This is a long episode, and I encourage you to listen to it in chunks if you need to, but I really want you to listen all the way through. Student motivation is a complex issue, and Robin is giving you concrete tools to solve the root problems permanently. We are not talking quick tips and hacks here. I promise if you can invest just under an hour of your time here into learning the principles from this episode, it will forever change your teaching. Robin's work is just that powerful. Don't muddle through the rest of the school year trying Band-Aid solutions with disengaged kids. It is not too late for a breakthrough. And these simple, powerful principles can make a huge difference quickly. So let's get started. So Robin, one of the most pervasive issues that I hear from teachers is students, quote, lack of motivation and disinterest in learning. So I want to tackle this phrasing first and get to the root of what we're talking about when we refer to disengaged kids who don't care about school. Do you believe that there is such a thing as a student who doesn't want to learn? You know, it's funny. I was just in a school this week uh, doing micro slicing with a group of administrators, and they told me that one of their biggest challenges was that they had so many students who were unmotivated, disengaged, not interested in learning. And we went into, you know, in the space of an afternoon, maybe eight classrooms. And in every single classroom, I, I didn't find one student who looked as if that student didn't want to learn. What I did find were a lot of students who were not interested in learning what the teacher had to teach. I found a lot of students who were not interested in learning in the way the teacher was taking them through the lesson, but they weren't, they didn't seem to me like they were uninterested in learning because there were times when they'd perk up or, you know, something would happen and you could see that they had an interest, but the way that the classroom was being conducted was kind of killing their motivation. And so I'm not sure that I believe that there is such a thing as an unmotivated kid, but I do believe that there are students who are unmotivated to learn either what we're teaching or they're unmotivated to learn in the way that we're asking them to learn. 
I agree with that. And, and what makes it tricky is that sometimes it can give teachers the impression that they have full responsibility when kids are disengaged. It's their fault. Their lessons must be boring. They must not have a good relationship with kids or there's something wrong with them if every student isn't 100% engaged all the time. So I want to acknowledge there's a lot of factors that go into this and a lot of factors that impact disengagement. Um, and then from there, talk about a principle that I know you espouse, which is about creating a classroom environment that is worth investing in. And I think that's really the key to shifting the culture of your classroom so that it is something that kids are interested. It is a place where they're interested in learning and you are teaching in a way that makes it easier for kids to be engaged. So can you talk a little bit about this classroom environment that's worth investing in? Yeah. And I, I do want to emphasize too that when I say that there are kids who may not want to learn what we're teaching or want to learn how we're teaching, I don't want anyone to walk away and think that I'm saying that it's the teacher's fault because a lot of it has to do with the way we were trained or how we're being expected to to teach students or um, that we're not given the right tools to be able to engage students. And then students do have a responsibility. I mean, I wrote a book called Never Work Harder Than Your Student. <laughs> so I believe that students have a huge responsibility. What I see a lot of teachers doing is I see them working very, very hard to engage students in ways that are never going to work. I see teachers who have been taught that if you just do this trick or if you just say this or if you just organize your classroom this way, this will lead to student engagement. This will lead to motivation. And those strategies and those tricks don't work on every kid. And so when I talk about creating a classroom worth investing in, I'm not talking about tricks and strategies and, you know, putting cool things on the wall or, you know, having mood lighting or creating, you know, reading corners. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that I believe that motivation is an investment decision, that students have time, attention, effort, and they are making a decision every single day about whether or not they want to invest that in our classroom or do they want to invest it in something else. Now, sometimes students have come to school and they're depleted of all of those things because of things that are happening at home. So they don't even have it to invest. So we have to understand that too. But what we can do as teachers and as educators is we can make sure that we have a classroom worth investing so that when students do have access to those things, they will make the choice to invest them in our classroom rather than withholding them and investing them in something else. So making a classroom worth investing in is really about creating a space where their time, their energy, and their effort will be rewarded, where where students will feel like, if I invest in this classroom, I'm going to get something back of equal or greater value for my investment. And a lot of times that's not going to be, you know, the formula for understanding the area of a triangle. That's not going to feel like an equal return for giving you my attention. What kids are looking for, in fact, what I believe all human beings are looking for is they're looking for four things. And research backs me up on this. In order to be motivated, every single human being has to have mastery, purpose, autonomy, and belonging. And study after study after study on motivation mentions one or more of those four things as saying those things are necessary for students to be motivated. So when I say you have to create a classroom worth investing in, how often do students have opportunities to experience mastery in your classroom every single day? How often do students have real opportunities to experience autonomy, not just you could use blue or black ink, choice autonomy, but real meaningful choices in terms of how they learn and what they learn and when they learn and why they learn. How often do our students have a real sense of connection to other students, to you as a teacher? And then how often do our students have a sense of purpose where they understand what they're learning and why they're learning and how they can use what they're learning in their real lives? And if we were intentional about that, a lot of the motivation issues that I see in classrooms would evaporate because students would choose to invest in your classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't solve 100% of the motivation issues, but it does solve a lot of the motivation issues that I believe are, are really easily preventable. What are some of the common classroom barriers to motivation that you've seen and how can teachers work through those? So there are four big barriers to 
um, investing in a classroom that students face on a day-to-day -day basis. The first one is instructional. The second is institutional. The third one is interpersonal. And the fourth one is internal. So I'll take um, each one and kind of break it down. And I'll show you what I'll talk about what I'm seeing a lot in schools lately with regard to those four barriers. So the big one with instructional barriers is that I am noticing that a lot of times teachers have been so drilled on quote unquote best practices and they are being evaluated in a way that they feel that they have to perform those best practices on a day to day basis that the teachers are, are losing a sense of understanding why they're teaching what they're teaching. I think that a lot of teachers are being made to jump through a lot of hoops. And when I sit down with teachers and talk to them and I ask them, okay, so why are you teaching this? Why is this important? No one has engaged them in that kind of conversation. They're just given a curriculum and expected to teach it. And a lot of teachers are being, you know, hand, handicapped by being given scopes and sequences that are prescribed down to the minute what they should be doing every single day. And we're not taking a step back as a, as a, as a, as a culture, an educational culture and asking, why are we teaching this? And so when we get up in front of students, that relevance is missing. So I'll often sit down with teachers and I'll say, okay, why are you teaching this? And they'll say, because it's on the test. And so I'll say, okay, why is it on the test? And then they'll say, because it's in the curriculum. And so we need to start, we need to take a step back and understand why it is that students need to learn it. Um, and if the students have that kind of real relevance, then I think it would, it would go a long way towards helping them invest in the classroom. I'll give you an example. I was working with a teacher recently who was teaching area and perimeter. And I asked her, I said, okay, so why are you teaching area and perimeter? And we went through the thing because it's on the test, because it's in the curriculum, that sort of thing. I says, why is it in the curriculum? And she thought for a moment and she said, well, if you ever want to lay carpet in an irregularly shaped room, you need to know area and perimeter. And I said, if that's all you've got, you're going to lose your kids right away. And we started laughing because who lays their own carpet anymore? Most people call somebody and they get it done. So we started digging a little deeper and we started thinking about, okay, how will students be able to think differently? What will they be able to do differently? And we came up with the reason that students need to understand area and perimeter is because it helps them make better decisions about space. Once we understood that, all these possibilities started emerging about how this can be relevant to students' lives. And when she went back and taught that lesson to her students, they were way more engaged and excited and motivated about it because she came from the standpoint of not you need to learn this because you're going to be tested on it, but you need to learn this because when you know this, you'll be able to make better decisions about space. And they include all kinds of decisions. And when she talked to them about the different kinds of decisions that they could make, all of a sudden her kids were interested. So if we could overcome that instructional barrier by making what we do more relevant, and that doesn't mean, you know, changing all of your word problems to, you know, Beyonce has one apple, Jay-Z has two apples, how many apples do you have? Yeah, that's not, that's fake relevance and, and kids will see through that. But really thinking through, why do, why do we need to know this and helping kids understand that? I think a lot more of our students will invest in our classrooms. Let's go back to finishing up the common classroom barriers. So we've talked now about instructional. The next one I think you had said was institutional. Yes. So a lot of times the rules that we have in our classroom present a barrier to motivation. I'll give an example. I remember as a teacher, I really believed in teaching bell to bell. And I wanted to be one of those tough teachers, you know, tough but fair. And so I told my, I want my kids to know I didn't play. So I would at the beginning of every period, I would tell my kids, look, if you are not in the classroom, in your seat, when the bell rings, you are late. And if you are late, you owe me a half hour detention. Now I thought I was cracking down and motivating kids to get to class on time, but here's the unintentional um, consequence of that rule. If a kid was running to my class and the bell rang and they were rounding the corner on the hallway to my class and the bell rang, I closed my door. What is that kid going to do? They already know they're going to owe me a half hour detention at lunch. So they will decide to take that half hour now. They'll slow down. They'll turn around. They'll go to the bathroom. They'll go to their lockers. They'll go to other classrooms and wave at their friends through the mirror, I mean, the window. And then finally, they'll stroll into my classroom 30 minutes 
after classes started. And I say, hey, see me for a detention. They're like, yeah, I know. They've already gotten their break now. So my rule was actually creating more tardies than it was preventing tardies. And our schools are rife with rules just like that, rules that are killing kids' motivation without our even realizing it. You know, the way that we deal with kids who are behind is we put them in remediation, which keeps them stuck behind, rather than focusing on acceleration, which helps them not only be successful tomorrow, but helps to start to fill the gap so that they can be successful next week and three weeks from now. Our rules can unintentionally demotivate kids when we were thinking in creating those rules that this was actually going to help kids do what they were supposed to do. So that's that's what I mean by institutional barriers. Okay. Um, the next one is interpersonal barriers. So interpersonal barriers, that's where we get into uh, the relationship that students have with a teacher. And that's when we also get into will drivers. And one of the fascinating things about will drivers is this. Every single person has a dominant will driver. So I believe every single person is either driven dominantly by mastery, purpose, belonging, or autonomy. Now, what happens is that as a teacher, we have a dominant will driver. And what we do is we try to motivate students based on our dominant will driver. So I'll use myself as an example. I am my mastery is my dominant will driver. I want to go in. I want to accomplish things. I'm driven by being able to accomplish things. And as a mastery driven person, the question that I'm always asking is how, how do I get better? How do I make the A? How do I make this better? How do I help kids? Everything is driven by how. So when I'm trying to motivate students, my default is going to be to try to motivate them in the same way that I'm motivated through mastery. So I'm going to sit down with students who are struggling and I'm going to say, don't worry, I can show you how to fix this. And I'm going to sit down with students whose heads are on their desk and I'm going to try to figure out how to to help them get their heads off the desk. What the problem is, is that not every student is driven by mastery. So if I am always going around answering how, 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 and my students are not asking that question, then my efforts to motivate them are going to fall flat. And what's going to be frustrating for me is I'm going to think, I'm doing everything I can. Why is this kid not motivated? It must be that kid. That kid must be lazy. When in reality, I'm just feeding them what feeds me without realizing that they need something different. So if I understand will drivers, then I know I'm mastery driven. I That helps me understand this is the, my default, but it also helps me understand what my student's default is. And then I can step outside of what I believe is best and I can feed my student what my student needs. And that helps me reach my students. This is also true for adults. I mean, I tell administrators all the time when they're talking about how do I motivate my teachers, if you are trying to motivate your teachers based on your will driver rather than being basing it on what the teacher's will driver is, it'll always fall flat. And so a big interpersonal barrier that's happening in the classroom is that there's this conflict of will drivers. Teachers privilege their will driver above all other will drivers, and they don't often recognize the other will drivers in the classroom. And so they only feed one will driver, which means that there's some students whose needs never get met. So, okay, so let's camp out on this a little bit before we talk about that last barrier to motivation. Realistically speaking, given how many students a teacher is dealing with, how can they identify students' motivation drivers and and their will drivers and figure out specific strategies for addressing those? So you're right. When you have a classroom full of students, it's really hard to identify everybody's will driver accurately off the bat. But the beautiful part about teaching is that we get to interact with our students every day, five days a week for 180 something days a year. And so you don't have to walk in the first day and know everybody's will driver. You just have to know that they exist. And what you do, and this is part of creating a classroom worth investing in, is that you create a classroom where every single day there's an opportunity for a student to feel mastery. Every single day there's an opportunity for a student to feel connection. Or every single day there's an opportunity for students to feel autonomous or a sense of purpose. And what you will find is that as you do that, there are some students who are going to gravitate to the part of the class where they get the mastery piece and others will gravitate to the belonging piece. And so you can just make sure that you are intentionally building all four into your classroom and you're meeting those, the needs of your students. Then watch your students, watch where they gravitate, watch where they 
where watch what they respond to and the students who are struggling the, that you're struggling the most to motivate those are the students you start with those are the students you study and you say okay what is that student's will driver because the moment you figure out that student's will driver and start feeding that student's will driver that student starts to turn that student starts to respond to you differently and then you do that with one or two or 10 students. And before long, you get so good at it, you start recognizing it. I, you, after a while, when you practice this and you start paying attention, people will tell you what their will drivers are and they'll tell you very early in, in the, your interactions with them. So I've been doing this for a long time now. I can go into a classroom and in a matter of minutes, you know, watch kids and how they're interacting and I can tell what their will driver is. And then you test it. So you think that this child is belonging driven. Belonging driven people are driven by the question of who, who am I to you? Who are you to me? Who's my friend? Who's my enemy? If you can start working with that student, and when I say feed their will driver, what I mean is, you know, find great ways to answer their primary question. So that's a student that I would say, you know, I'd look at something that they did. And instead of saying you worked really hard at this, I would say you're a hard worker. It's a it's a small nuance, but a student who is asking who hears you are a hard worker, that student is going to respond to that because you're feeding their will driver. And that student's going to be motivated again to do more work because you think I'm a hard worker. Now, if I said to a mastery driven kid, you are a hard worker, a mastery driven kid might say, oh, well, they think I'm working hard. They think I'm a hard worker. They don't think I'm smart. So a mastery, you could say that same thing to a mastery driven kid. And they're asking like, how, how, how can I get better? If I'm saying hard worker, hard mastery driven kids are about accomplishment. Hard worker says I'm working hard to accomplish something. A mastery driven kid might take that totally differently and may, may not be motivated by that because they're not asking who they're asking how. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Can can you keep going with that? Give us some more examples because you're talking about building this into the lesson. So there's like different opportunities for kids with different will drivers to have those needs met. What would that look like? So let's, I'm a secondary teacher. So let me take a secondary classroom. You know, between class periods, everybody's busy. The teacher's working on getting ready for the next group of kids and kids come in, but the belonging driven kids would love it if you acknowledge them when you, you when they came in the room. So, you know, taking time away from kind of setting things up and being at the door, greeting kids. Some kids are going to walk by. Your belonging driven kids are going to stop. They're going to chat. They, you, they want to know that you see them right away. Then when you start, let's say you do a warm up, doing a warm up and giving kids options around the warm up. So here's today's warm up. So we're going to be doing, I don't know, sentence combining. So you can pick this sentence, this sentence, or this sentence, or if you want, you can do two or three, but we've got five minutes and you need to combine at least one of these two sets of sentences in the next five minutes. So now you've given kids options and choices, but you've also fed that mastery driven kid who says, and so, you know, I can do all four and the autonomy driven kid, I have choices. So the autonomy driven kid may just pick one sentence. They may pick two or three or whatever. And then you do that. Then when you get everybody together and you start the day, you start out by talking about why you are doing what you're going to do. Here's what we're doing. Here's the success criteria. Here's what success looks like for today. That's for your mastery driven kids. Here's why we're doing it. That's for your purpose driven kids. So purpose driven people cannot get motivated if they don't have a, a satisfying why. And That's so me. giving them that satisfying <laughs> why from the very beginning. I've got to have the why. If I don't know, if it doesn't make sense to me, if I don't see a purpose, I'm not doing it. I'm going to question the whole thing and I'm going to resist the entire thing. <laughs> okay. So why would I make you wait? throughout the class period to ha to answer that why question. Well, that's your number one question. I'm going to start the class period asking, I mean, answering the why question, right? So that you can get motivated to get the work, get to work right away. I'm also going to talk about what is success look like again, because the mastery driven kid says, oh, okay, is that what success looks like? Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And then the other thing I'm going to do is that throughout the class period, I'm going to talk, I'm going to be checking in with kids and I'm going to make sure that I get to all of my kids. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to give some, you know, I'm going to let my hair down and, and be a real human being because those belonging driven or connection driven kids need that in order to connect with me, in order to connect with the work. They don't care about the work until they care about you. So whoever wrote that expression, 
They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That was a belonging driven person. And those are belonging driven mm-hmm. kids. So you've got- Okay, that's a good point. I want to stop on that actually, because I see debates every single time that thing is shared with like a <laughs> portion of the people saying, it's so true. Kids are only going to learn from teachers they like. And then there's a whole cadre of people who are like, what are you talking about? I had all kinds of teachers that I didn't like and I learned so much from. Kids don't have to like you. That's not the goal. Yeah. And so now the way you're explaining it, that makes perfect sense to a belonging driven person. That's a hundred percent true, but we're not all like that. And it goes back to what you were saying about how we privilege our own wheel drivers and we assume everyone's like us. Yep. And so people will debate that saying to the death because for a certain group of people, that is gospel. It is true. And it's true for them. And their experience has has borne it out because belonging-driven people, remember, you feed what you need. So belonging-driven people are feeding that in their kids. They are, they're showing their kids how much they care. And the kids who are also belonging driven respond to that, right? But the kids who are mastery driven, they may respond to it as well, but they don't need it to be successful. Or the kids who are autonomy driven, a lot of autonomy driven kids may not respond to that because it feels suffocating. And autonomy driven kids always need, they always want to know where the exits are. They always want to know that they have a choice, they have an out. And so if you're not conveying that, see, I feel so sorry for autonomy driven kids in school because there's almost Mm -hmm. no opportunity for meaningful autonomy in school. Even when we give kids tic-tac-toe choice boards, those there's no option for a kid to say, how about none of them? How about you tell me what you want and I will come up with my own way to deliver that to you? So we, we almost never have those choices. So the more that you can build meaningful choices into your classroom, then the better. Now, what's going to happen is when you start giving too many choices, your mastery driven kids are going to say, well, which one is the best one? Tell me which one to do. So you have to give people some, (laughs) some choice criteria to help them with their choices. So I might say you could do this, you know, like if I was giving homework assignment, I'd say, okay, so now we've gone through what we've done today and tonight's homework is designed for you to practice so that you can become more fluent in this new skill that you just learned. I'm going to say that to the homework. Two reasons. One is I want the purpose-driven kids to know why we're doing the homework. And I want the mastery-driven kids to know what's the success criteria. And then I'm going to say something like, now you have several options. If you struggled with this part, I would focus on these problems right here. If you feel like you're pretty fluent already, I would focus on these problems right here and I would time myself so I can get better. If you feel like you are struggling, then I would focus on these problems right here and I'm going to give you another resource that you can take home tonight just in case you get stuck so that you will have everything you need. And by the time you're done with this, you should feel like you understand it. And if you don't understand it tomorrow, don't worry about it because when you come back to class, I want you to tell me what part you don't understand. And we're going to start right away dealing with that so that you can make sure you understand it because this is important. Everybody got it? Good. And then with then everybody kind of gets what they need. The autonomy driven kids get a choice on options. The master driven kids get options, but they also get success criteria. The purpose driven kids get a why. And the belonging driven kids get the idea that, you know what, you're not a failure if you don't get it. I'm going to be here for you. I'll I'll be able to answer your questions the next day. I just want you to try it. So everybody's question has been answered. Mastery driven question mastery driven kids have gotten the answer to how. The purpose driven kids have gotten the answer to why. The belonging driven kids have gotten the answer to who. And the autonomy driven kids have gotten the answer to what. Autonomy driven people, their big question is what? What are my options? What do I have to do? What don't I have to do? What can I what can I bring to the table? So they are always looking for options. And so we have to be able to give them those the answer to that. Now sometimes there won't be options. You know, everybody has to take a test. And autonomy driven kids are fine with that. They don't want anarchy. They just want to know that they have options. So we've talked about interpersonal, we've talked about instructional, we've talked about institutional. What's the final common classroom barrier to motivation? So the last barrier to motivation is the internal barrier, and it's the most difficult one because that's that barrier is something that kids bring with them. So kids who have experienced a lot of trauma, they come to school and they can't focus because of you know everything else that's going on in their lives. Or kids whose parents are getting a divorce, or or kids who have you know food insecurity, or are facing other issues that come with poverty, or you know kids who are having a surge of hormones, whatever it is, those are internal barriers to motivation. And 
in the past, we've treated those like a black box. There's really nothing you can do about it. You know, what do I do if kids, you know, these kids nowadays, all they want to do is be on their devices. What am I supposed to do about that? But there is something that we can do and it's not going to solve everything. I think, you know, we have to really rethink how we're providing uh, additional services to our students because I don't think schools have enough social workers and psychologists and resources for kids who are experiencing trauma. I do, you know, I don't think we have a, a good grip on trauma informed um, instruction and we're not giving those resources to teachers, you know, sitting teachers in an afternoon half day in service and bringing in the speaker and talking about trauma informed instructional practices is not going to do it. But I am really encouraged by a lot of the work that's happening in trauma-informed instructional practices. I'm really encouraged by a lot of the work that's happening in mindfulness right now, where you, people are really starting to understand the brain biology around why kids shut down and what's happening inside of kids. I just think that we need to equip and empower teachers with this information. I think that we need to give them meaningful training around these, these things. When you do that, I think that we would be a lot more successful in addressing some of those internal barriers. But for the most part, we don't get it in school. We're not getting in our teacher preparation programs. We're not even getting the, you know, the half day in service in a lot of schools. We're just told that you go in and no matter what, you have to figure it out. But there are so many, there's so much research. There's so much really interesting, groundbreaking um, thought around this that I think we should be getting to teachers much more quickly so that teachers have this that's in the resources so that they can deal with some of those internal barriers and help kids to still choose to invest in the classroom in spite of all the things they're going through. So if the barrier is interpersonal and a teacher doesn't feel like they really have the resources to help the student with that, what's the best approach? Okay. So again, probably not the best person because what I just can only talk about what I would do. And if I have an internal barrier in front of me, and I don't know how to handle it. I'm going for help. I'm, you know, I'm going online. I'm ordering books. I am talking to professionals. I remember as a teacher, I was having some trouble. I had some students who were um, undocumented and they had a huge gap in their education. So um, when they, when they came to the U.S., they went through an ESL program, but they had not, they'd had like two or three years gap in their schooling. And I was trying to reach them. They had recently come out of ESL and I really just didn't have experience or the expertise to be able to reach them. And I found we had a community liaison um, in our school who worked with families who were going through a lot of the same things that the, the, that group of kids was going through. And I invited her to come have lunch with me at the school one day. And she sat down and I just said, okay, talk me through what am I missing? And I asked for her help and she helped me. She, she, she looked at the kids. She came and sat in my classroom, looked at the kids. She talked to the kids. She knew their families. She talked to their families. She taught me some things that I just didn't understand um, about kids who are going, who are in that situation and, and how they, how, what they were dealing with. She taught me some things that I didn't understand about culture um, and she helped me. And then I was able to reach those kids. And so if you don't have the resources, find them, get them, you know, go online, read the book, find somebody else. A lot of times what I do, if I'm struggling with a particular kid, I find somebody in the building who, who has had success with that kid. And I say, okay, tell me your secret. Or I find somebody in the building who is being successful with the kind of kid I'm dealing with. And I just, I've, I shadow them. I study them. I become a sponge until I can learn. Now, a lot of that's the mastery in me, you know, how, how, how I'm going through and like, how do I reach this kid? But I feel like if you don't have the resource, you still have access. There's somebody who knows. There's somebody who's written a book about it. There's somebody, there's a podcast you can listen to. There's, there's some resource out there. Find that resource because we got to figure out a way to reach every single kid. I do not give myself a pass and I don't give anybody else a pass by just saying, well, I've got too much to do and that kid just has too many profound problems and I don't know what to do about it. I just don't buy that. I believe that if they're in my classroom, they're mine and I have to do my best for that kid. That's right. And it's not like it's a walk in the park if you do nothing, you know, like you're creating massive amounts of stress and extra work for yourself 
and, and probably having your whole class derailed every single day for the rest of the year. Or you can invest a half an hour into trying to talk to someone else in your school and get a little bit more insight and some solutions. It's, it's sort of a no-brainer to me. And then again, I'm a purpose-driven person. So <laughs> I'm just thinking, what's the point of continuing to teach the way that I'm teaching when it's not working? I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to have to find a solution. That's what would drive me. It's like, it's pointless to keep going the way that we're going. Something has to give. Something has to change it. I'm not going to settle for things to continue like this. And I'll go find solutions, same as you. But it's just interesting how we're, we're working from different places, that you're working because you want to have the best solution. You want to master the situation. And for me, it's just about what I, I need a point. I can't just show up and teach a kid that's not going to learn that's pointless. Yeah, I think we've been trained to look at outcomes and ascribe to those outcomes the same motivation. And it's a huge it's a huge mistake to do that. I think we do that with kids all the time, right? We look at a kid who is achieving and we think, oh, they're achieving because, the, you know, we think about all the reasons why we would be achieving. And then we think, yeah, they're doing it the same reason, for the same reason. They're not. Some kids are working hard because they want to please you. Some kids are working hard because they are driven to conquer and master everything. Some pe- some kids are working hard because they see the point and they buy into the point. Some kids are working hard because they feel like working hard. You know, we look at the outcome, the A, and we think, oh, well, that kid's a motivated kid. But we don't understand why they're motivated. So what happens if things in a classroom change and the thing that was motivating them is no longer there. Then we're saying, well, what's happened to this kid? And, you know, we're panicking or freaking out. If we understood their motivation, we'd understand what's happening. We'd understand how to maintain it and sustain it over time. The other thing is that even if I'm a mastery driven kid, it doesn't mean that I'm always going to be the A student. Some of the students who are failing miserably in your classroom right now are mastery driven. They can't figure out how to be successful, but that's what they're looking for. So don't look at those kids. And that's why they, they shut out, they shut down, they turn off, they, they stop working because they can't figure out how to get mastery in your classroom. So it's not that they're not motivated. They are motivated. They just don't know. They're not getting the answer to how. There's some kids who are belonging driven, who are some of the most isolated, mean kids out there. They need belonging badly. They don't know how to get it. There's some kids who are very purpose driven, but who seem like they don't have a sense of purpose at all. And it's because they haven't found a sense of purpose that they can believe in yet. And there are some kids who are autonomy driven, who, when given choices, shut down because even though they need choices, they don't know how to make good choices. So we can't judge kids based on their outcomes. We have to look for what drives them, look for that will driver and feed it. And then when we do, that's what turns things around for the kids. It's so much more nuanced and complex than just saying these kids just don't care about education. They just don't value an education. They just don't want to learn. There's so much more there to unpack. Yeah. I mean, you know, I always, one of the things I always say is be who you want to see. And one of the things that happens to teachers a lot is administrators put them in boxes. You're just not motivated. You're just, you just don't want to work hard. You just want to give up on kids. You don't care enough about kids. And we would never allow that to happen because we say there are things that are more nuanced. It's, I do care about kids. I'm working as hard as I can for these kids. But at some point, I've, I've run out of tools. And so what else am I supposed to do? I have to still be able to teach the other kids in the class. We would never let somebody look at that and just, you know, label us as lazy or that we don't care about kids. But then when we reach a breaking point, we're often tempted to do that with our students and just write them off as lazy or that they don't care. And so you need to be who you want to see. If, if you would never allow somebody to do that for you, if you recognize the nuance in the work that you do, you need to do that for your kids. If you understand that there are extenuating circumstances every single day that affect your motivation. And it's not that you are a bad teacher. It's not that you don't want to work hard, but you believe that this unit is stupid. So I'm not teaching it. Or you believe that that this unit is not going to allow you to be successful or you don't like your boss. So you're not going to do it. You, know, you have those reasons that, that explain why you behave, why you behave. Well, be open to the fact that your students also have those reasons. Look for them, dig for them. Because once you understand that, you stop seeing kids as lazy. I mean, I, there are lazy kids. Let's just be real. There are lazy kids. <laughs> but usually the kids that we call lazy, they're not being lazy. They're just looking for a good answer to their question, their will driver. And unless you answer that, you're never going to reach them. 
Yeah, that was definitely true for me as a student. All of my teachers would say I was unmotivated. I didn't apply myself. I wasn't working to my potential. I was so disengaged. But it's it's the wheel driver, like you were saying. My I didn't see the point. I didn't understand why we were doing what we were doing. I didn't know how I'd use it. Just didn't seem as interesting or relevant to me as the things that I cared about. And but I wasn't lazy. I certainly would have looked lazy if you had if you had seen me then. And I also looked disorganized, which is sort of ironic now, given how ironic I am, how uh, organized I am as an, as an adult. But now I have a purpose and right. now I have autonomy. I can do it the way that I need to do it in a way that makes sense for me. And that's, that's a game changer for me. Yeah. Imagine if you had had a teacher who looked at you and saw beyond the disengagement and understood that you were just waiting for somebody to help you see the point. And imagine if that teacher had helped you see the point. It would have made all the difference. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and teachers, the same thing is true. I mean, I spend most of my time, I developed wheel drivers to try to help teachers motivate students, but I spend most of my time talking about wheel drivers to administrators mm-hmm. uh, because administrators do the same thing. They fall into the same trap of looking at teachers and labeling them a certain way, when in reality, those teachers aren't lazy or disengaged. Those teachers are looking for the point or they're looking for the answer to their wheel driver, whatever that their wheel driver is. There are kids right now in your classroom who would start to engage, who are, who are begging somebody to come in and answer their question. Who, what, why, how? And if you did that, they would immediately turn on. They'd be so engaged in school. And imagine how different their outcome might be if you did that, if you took the time to understand their wheel driver, to feed their wheel driver, and help them to learn in a way that was purposeful and meaningful and lasting rather than just going through the motions, biding their time until they can get out of your classroom. And then imagine the difference it makes in how much you enjoy your work when you're actually connecting with your kids, when your kids are actually being successful, when your kids are actually um, becoming more independent thinkers and learners and, 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 and going out of your classroom, not only understanding, but excited about what they're learning and going out of your classroom with a purpose every single day. I think this motivation issue is a huge one. I, I think we talk about it in very superficial terms, but if you really want to reach all of your students, then you need to start thinking about how to reach all of your students. And it's not going to be a magic trick. There's not, like, you know, people ask me all the time, like, is there a test I can give my students so they can tell me their wheel driver and I could just, you know, take their results and then, you know, feed their wheel driver? And of course not. No, I don't even want to create that kind of test because that's a very disengaged way of connecting with kids. Understanding kids' wheel drivers is really about spending time with them, getting to know them, paying attention to who they are. You don't want to shortcut that work because that work is going to help you. It's going to help you understand the nuance of each individual kid and be able to feed their wheel drivers in a way that almost feels natural. The moment you start testing and saying, oh, this is a belonging driven kid. So every single day I need to tell them you're so smart. You're so kind. You're so important. That's not the the point. The point is to pay attention to the kids look at what they need and find ways to feed their wheel driver in a way that's unique to every single kid. I know that sounds more complex, but you know, frankly, that's what teaching is. It's not about standing in front of the room and talking to 30, you know, kids who are rap- paying rapt attention to you. It's really about standing in front of the room and finding a way to reach 30 individuals and help them learn in a meaningful way. What would you say to a teacher who's listening to this and thinking, you know, we're well into the school year at this point, and I feel like I have just tried everything for this kid. I I just, nothing seems to be working. I don't feel like there's anything I can do now to get them invested in my class. So a lot of it depends on the kid's wheel driver. I've walked into schools where, you know, I come in the middle of the year, teachers hear about wheel drivers. They take a kid who they've already spent so much time investing in and nothing has worked. They apply the wheel drivers to that student. And within a matter of weeks, they have a breakthrough with a kid all year long and they have a breakthrough. The only challenge is that if that kid's wheel driver is belonging, because belonging driven people, remember, their question is who. And if your actions all year long have been conveying, I don't value you. 
I don't like you. I don't believe in you. Then if you go back and start saying, hey, your, your wheel driver must be who? So I, you know, just want you to know I like you. I believe in you. I value you. But it's not sincere. It's not real. They're not going, you're not going to reach that kid. So it's not, I, so the answer is two part. First of all, if you have a kid you're struggling with and you have tried everything, try wheel drivers because I've seen it over and over again. When you understand a student's wheel driver and when you start to feed that wheel driver in a way that conveys that you really care, then you can reach that kid. And I've seen it happen in a matter of weeks, not months, not years, in a matter of weeks because we can't resist our own wheel drivers. We really can't. The second part of that is that you have to mean it. Like you can't go in and you know, say, okay, let me try this new tool with the kid because I want to reach the kid because he's getting on my nerves. And if I could get him quiet and working, then, you know, my classroom would run a lot more smoothly. That's not going to work. The only way that wheel drivers work is they have to come from a place of authenticity. You have to genuinely care about a student. So you're not just feeding their wheel drivers. I remember one time I was training I was in some a group on wheel drivers and one of my mastery driven people in the audience was saying, so with belonging driven people, you know, how do I convey that I care who they are? Should I, should I use body language? And he's trying to show me body language where he's walking up to them and like fake hugging them. And I was like, no, <laughs> this is not, this is not a paint by numbers thing. You know, if your students need this, do that. It doesn't work that way. You have to really mean it. You have to really care enough about a kid to not only discover their wheel driver, but consistently feed it. And if you feed it one time, if you do one thing that you think, oh, it's belonging driven and you know the, the, the child doesn't respond right away, you also have to trust the process that it will work. If you are not seeing results in a matter of weeks, you're probably feeding the wrong wheel driver. And I've done this. I've made this mistake. I looked at somebody and I was like, oh, they are definitely mastery. And I've had mastery for two months and the relationship just deteriorated. It just got worse and worse and worse. And then I realized, oh my goodness, I thought they were mastery, but really they're belonging. I switched and started feeding belonging and the relationship turned around in a matter of days. So if you are feeding somebody's wheel driver, genuinely, authentically feeding their wheel driver and you're not seeing results, go back and rethink whether or not you guessed their wheel driver correctly. And if you didn't, you know, try to figure out, okay, so mastery is not it. So what are the other three and go figure out, you know, even if it's process of elimination, people can't resist their wheel driver. So you should see responses within a matter of weeks. I want to close out the show with a takeaway truth, something for teachers to remember in the week ahead. So what is something that you wish every teacher understood about student motivation and working with kids who are disengaged in class? I, I, it's hard because I'm like I'm five. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take them all, Robin. Everything you say is brilliant. So give us as many as you want. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's brilliant. I just, you know, like I, my, my, because I'm mastery driven, I, I don't want one takeaway. I want, I want you to do it all, right? So, <laughs> like, I, but if I have to think about the most important thing, Start by understanding your own wheel driver and then watch how what you default to is actually how, how that affects your students' relationships with you. So for instance, once I understood that I was mastery driven, the first thing that I realized to my horror was that I was giving my students, my workshop participants, everybody too much information. Because when you're mastery driven, you want to know like what's the right thing to do. So I go and I gather all this information. I do a lot of thinking about it. And then I emerge and I say, I have the answer. And then I want to share it with the world. And it's like drinking from a fire hose sometimes. Once I understood that, then I started to slow down. I started to say, okay, I can't, they can't take it all. I'm, I'm too much. So I have to break it out into pieces and I have to make sure that I give people time to process and I have to make sure. So understanding my own wheel driver changed my behavior. And my, when my behavior changed, it changed how motivated and engaged my students or my workshop participants were. I think the same thing could be true for teachers. So maybe the most powerful thing you can do right now is to stop and think, Am I mastery driven? Am I purpose driven? Am I belonging driven? Am I autonomy driven? And then start paying attention to how that wheel driver 
is actually impacting your relationships with your colleagues, your relationships with your students, what you default to in the classroom, what you privilege in the classroom, and what you ignore in the classroom, what you count as ridiculous and foolish when it may be not ridiculous and foolish to somebody else. So if you could just understand your own will driver and also understand that not everybody shares your will driver, just that understanding alone can go a long way towards making you more aware of, of differences in people and to help you start to f- see them and feed those differences so that you can get more people motivated. For more from Robin on this topic, check out the link in the show notes to her book, How to Motivate Reluctant Learners. It is a short, powerful read. Or you can check out episode six of her podcast, School Leadership Reimagined, which is also linked to in the show notes. You'll find the audio and the transcript for her episode called The Most Powerful Way to Motivate Anybody. Have a great week. You can do this. And remember, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be worth it.